Welcome, welcome. Welcome, 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 welcome. <laughs> oh, gonna let the nerds pull in. I got a little musical selection for you. The karaoke version. I will be singing here in a bit. Can you hear me? In the Jay's analysis stream. Can you hear me? I'm really sweaty. And I've got a chain around my neck. It's gay as heck. I'm really sweaty. And I've got moose in my hair. And a lot of gel. Moose in jail at the same time, and a little bit of hairspray, and a lot of chain. Cause I still believe. I still believe. Happy Halloween, nerds. Don't really celebrate Halloween around the Jason Elsa Studios, but that's okay. I'm gonna sing this in a minute here. I'm gonna let the nerds pile in. Just let the pile in. Did you know he used to tour with Tina Turner? Sexy sax man Tim Capella. Toured Capello, excuse me. He toured and opened for Tina Turner. Lost Boys, baby. I got some we're gonna have fun tonight. I I've seen Lost Boys way too many times. Uh, mainly because uh, some of my friends and I really got a kick out of it. And we thought it was funny, so we would watch it over and over and over. And somebody came up with the idea one time of saying, or uh, doing a drinking game based around how many times they say Michael in the movie, which we quickly discovered cannot be done. You will black out. Michael, Michael, Michael is repeated ad nauseum. It's half of the script, half of the screenplay is Kiefer Sutherland and his gang of ne'er-do-well Confederate general outfit-wearing Jim Morrison-looking vampires saying, Michael, 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 Michael. <laughs> so, yeah, if you haven't seen Counts the Lost Boys, where you been, bro? Where you been, bro? What you been up to, bro? But I'm going to sing this whole song in a minute. I, it was requested. A lot of people were like, please give us Sexy Sax Man. Um, this was originally going to be video, and I would have uh, I would have been in my tank top, or I would have gone full Sticks Hexenhammer for you guys uh, to do the Tim Capello, I Still Believe, song. But I got preoccupied this morning with issues relating to theology, theological controversy. So, uh, of course, since the stream I did earlier today, uh, one of the public figures that I criticized apparently reported me. So my main Facebook profile is banned for 30 days. Not that I care. I expected that kind of stuff. We've been banned on Facebook quite a few times around here. So 
Um, little news <coughs> news flash here. Criticism of public figures and people who tout themselves as public figures is not illegal and is not harassment. You are free to do that. That is one of the great things we do still appreciate about our country is free speech, which is apparently going out the window. So, uh, I do want to also get, before I get going here, I'm going to tell you what, there's a great, I don't know if this is copyrighted, I hope not, but uh, before we play that goofy karaoke, there is a synth wave <laughs> version of the Lost Boys, I still believe, which is pretty funny. So let's play a little bit of that. Now, there was a super chat earlier today that came in as I was ending the stream. And so, uh, Mr. Stam here, J Stam, I didn't want you to think I was not ignoring it. Sometimes the super chats come in and it takes a little while for it to register on screen. So if you put your super chat in, we're like, you know, when I'm about to end the stream and then it shows up later, it's not that I was avoiding you. Uh, and this is, I've noticed other people too were saying, I've uh, taken a long time to get to super chats. Sometimes it takes this a while to register and I don't see them in the control room settings that I'm looking at. So you might be seeing it popping up on your, your chat screen. Uh, and then I'm seeing it a little bit later in the, the, uh, control room. All right. So let me potty real quick. Let some more nerds pile in. There's a little bit of, I still believe, synth wave. Let's get into this. Now, I want to say first of all, uh, on the super chat, please speak on the assassination of Martin Luther King after he came out against the Vietnam War, which was a plan of the order to sustain the war longer. Yeah, so I have I've delved pretty deeply into Vietnam in the last year. Um, it was something I didn't know a whole lot about, but uh, at least three books now that I've read treat it pretty deeply, and it was, uh, in my mind, definitely about drugs, money, prolonging the war. Uh, I think that's what it was about, and then that had an effect of social engineering, and uh, as the Boert book that we just did, and by the way, for those who are Jay's Analysis followers, uh, I'm almost done with the Boert book. I'll try to have that up tomorrow for the subscriber section. Uh, so, um, I do think there was obviously some deep state faction behind the MLK thing, 
but I've only read one book that treated of MLK that I can recall, and I think it was Jim Keith. I think Jim Keith has a chapter in uh, one of his books that I read ages ago, maybe 13, 14 years ago. I read a bunch of Jim Keith books. That was kind of when I was new to the to the conspiracy world, and uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of good stuff in Jim Keith books. He he adopted some unfortunate, weird views towards the end of his his days, but I did learn a lot from uh, Mass Consciousness. That book is really good by Jim Keith. Um, his Aliens, Saucers of the Illuminati book is pretty good, where he posits that uh, it's not just government, it's not just people making up tales, and it's not just some sort of uh, esoteric spiritual phenomena. So the Jim Keith thesis, you know, kind of lines up with the aliens or demons type thesis. Although uh, Jim Keith appears to eventually have gotten into occultic stuff towards the end of his days. But that's what happens to a lot of people who go down the alien route, you know, really getting into studying aliens. This is always bound up with people who get into the occult. And we're actually going to see that in Life Force. That's what Life Force is about. But we're not going to get to Life Force until later on. So let's get to the first treasure here. Uh, before we start with Blade, I am going to sing this song because it was requested. And I'm going to sing it like Saxman in his voice. Go away. It's, I got the karaoke thing going, so this is super cheese ball karaoke here. I'm in a tank top dancing around. You can't see me right now, but I look just like this guy on the screen. Da 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 da. This is like my third time ever doing karaoke. I've been in a cave for 40 days. Only a spark to light my way. I want to give out. I want to give in. This is our crime. This is our sin. But I still believe. I still believe. Through the pain and the grief. I still believe. Through the lies. Through the storms. Through the cries. And through the wars. <coughs> Ow. This is hard. <coughs> I still believe. I still believe. I still believe. Here's a weird line. Listen to this. Flat on my back. <laughs> Out at sea. <laughs> Flat on my back. Flat on my back, out at sea, hopping these waves, don't cover me. I'm turned and tossed upon the waves. When the darkness comes, I feel the grave, but I still believe, I still believe. Through the cold and through the heat, through the rain, <laughs> through the tears. Through the crowds and through the cheers, oh, I still believe. 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 Bridge. I'll march this road, I'll climb this hill upon my knees If I have to, <laughs> I'll take my place upon this stage I'll wait till the end of time for like everybody else What? Very bizarre, what is this song about? It's about nothing. All these kinds of songs are about nothing. It's a long ass song. 
We got more on a whole nother bunch of lyrics. I'm out of my own, walking the streets. Look at the faces that I meet. I feel like I, like I want to go home. What do I feel? <laughs> what do I know? I just said it. But I still believe. Yes, I still believe. Through the shame and through the grief. Through the heartache and through the tears. Through the waiting and through the years. For people like us in places like this. We all need hope that we can get. Oh, I still believe. Okay. All right. There we go. <coughs> I was tearing up my throat and about to lose my voice singing this stupid ass Lost Boy song. <laughs> All right. We almost got 140 nerds from that. What do you think, guys? Did you like the Tim Capella acapella? Dude, he's going. He's blowing nuts on that sax. Woo! Ah. Uh, welcome to Jay's Analysis. I still believe. <laughs> Somebody, by the way, edited that into a funny clip where, uh, if you remember the movie, that's where uh, Jason, uh, Jason, now what's his face? The main dude, Jason, that uh, the brother, that's where he meets Star, <laughs> uh, the love interest, and he somebody edited this into a funny clip where he, it's not him looking at star, but it's him looking at the, uh, sax guy. So I'll put that there that you can watch that later. It's funny stuff. Anyway, um, let me replace my theology stuff from earlier and I'll put it in the video description. All right. So let's talk a little bit of blade. Now that we did the housekeeping, Housekeeping. Housekeeping. <laughs> I still believe through the something and through the crap, through the nonsense of the song and the movie. I still believe. All right, Blade. You know, I didn't see Blade until not too long ago. Seriously, I don't know why. I just somehow had missed this gem in the 90s and this is 98 yeah okay so let me get a little bit of blade imagery going here our friend Wesley Pipes Kurt Cobain and Wesley Pipes if you've seen Dave Chappelle's movie <laughs> Uh, now, you know, we're not being super serious tonight. Some of this is tongue in cheek. Blade is goofy. However, there were some interesting elements, even in this goofy blade. Aren't there? Sorry. I'm almost, uh, almost right. And of course, if you guys want to, uh, chime in, you're welcome to. Golden Girls. Somebody's wanting that Golden Girl t-shirt that I still haven't given out. Still got it signed. I had people asking about that when I spoke in California. They were like, yo, dude, give me that Golden Girl shirt. <laughs> I might give that away soon. We'll see. But, uh, and interesting. wonder why the IRS went after Wesley. Remember how they painted him when they went after him as like this villain? And then when you get woke, you realize, dude, they were targeting him. Give me a break. Uh, so, pregnant woman is attacked by a vampire giving birth in the 60s. They're able to save her. The woman dies of infection. This is, of course, Blade and the... He's born of vamp, but... 
because they kill him at the moment of his con- they kill her at the moment of his conception. He has this power to be able to walk around in the sun, and he's a daywalker. Now, this is going to sound really stupid, but there actually is an illuminist theme to the vampire narrative. And that's why I decided to go ahead and go for Vamp Night tonight. Um, so 30 years later, Blade is a vampire hunter because he's just been pissed this whole damn time. <laughs> uh, Blade does not look 30, by the way. He looks more like 45, but will grant... Wesley Snipes, that he is a young-looking dude. He's a, a dapper man. So maybe he could pass for 30, although not really. But And he goes to the rave, dog. There is a rave, because there was raves everywhere in the 90s. And vampires love raves, right? Because the in the 90s, the goth subculture, it intertwined, interwove with... I want a little bit, of, a little bit of music in the background. It inter it intertwined with the rave culture, didn't it? Yes, it did. And this movie, uh, which is the same year as as um, the Matrix, is very Matrix esque. And it was a hit. Let's see. What did it see? Uh, Forty-five million made one hundred thirty million. Yeah, that was that was good '90s money right there. And we all know that Blade is a is a trilogy. And again, Blade Trinity is the. We're only going to be looking at Blade One tonight. Eventually, I'll just do a whole Blade stream or something. But uh, the reason I bring that up is that the the name of of the film itself, it's it's trilogy and it's Trinity, it obviously is full of biblical imagery and symbology in, you know, very weird and esoteric ways. So Blade has a kind of miraculous birth. So immediately we're presented with the variant on the virgin birth theme. This is an archetypal thing that's always put into stories. Um, but they, they speak at length in this film of the importance of the blood the vamp rave they're all taking vamps to see they're vamping out Uh, and there's a giant sprinkler system that sprays blood this is what the (laughs) the goth vamp ravers use this as their cover uh, to feast on unwitting stupid humans that want to go to the raves right so this is basically matrix with vamps Vamp, the vamp tricks. Um, we we aren't really told, I don't think, why Chris Christopherson is a weapons manufacturer to Blade. <laughs> He's just there. He's just kind of uh, stuck there as the uh, the arms man at arms for Blade. Um, but meanwhile, one of the girls at the rave, uh, what else? See, uh, the police take one of the vampires to the hospital where he feeds on hematologist Karen uh, Jensen and escapes. Blade takes Karen to the safe house with Chris Christopherson, and we learn that there's been a secret world going on the whole time between. Vampires using weapons based on their elemental weakness, such as sunlight and silver. Karen is now marked by the body of the vampire, and both he and Blade tell her to leave the city. Then we have a meeting of the Illuminati Vampire Council. Uh, and Stephen Dorff plays Frost. What a name. The head of the Illuminati Vampire Council. And he wants to incite a giant war between the vamps and the humans because previously the vamps were nice and friendly and getting along with the humans. Now, upon returning, Karen gets attacked by a policeman who is a familiar, a human mind control slave. 
So the vamps have mind control slaves in the police department. Sounds like what we were just talking about in the Walter Bowart book, doesn't it? Um, Blade, of course, is the, as we said, the miraculously born figure here, our savior figure. And we figure out that the, uh, while experimenting with the anticoagulant EDTA as a possible replacement, Karen discovers that it explodes when combined with vampire blood. So they figure out a way to kill the vampires. But the vampires have been working on this summoning ritual for La Magra, the vampire blood god. And they have a secret crypt, the Temple of Eternal Night, where if they unite everything together in the right ritual and actions, it will invoke La Magra. And they also have their own vamp Bible, which is, uh, I think it was Coptic. Interestingly, written in Coptic or something, if I recall. And uh, this suggests what, like Gnostic, Luciferian, Luminist ideas. Uh, by the way, I just watched Eye of the Devil, the first Sharon Tate film. Very bizarre. It's uh, Eyes Wide Shut before Eyes Wide Shut. It's a very interesting movie. Um, and in Eye of the Devil, spoiler alert, the Cathars, the medieval Gnostic sect in France, had a secret tradition where they have survived in a French village in a palace and a vineyard owner who has kept the rites since the Middle Ages of human sacrifice. And they serve Satan, serve Lucifer. And Donald Pleasance plays the Luciferian priest. Donald Pleasance plays the Luciferian priest once again. Always the evil Gnostic priest. I wonder what Donald Pleasance's real views in life were, because he plays a Gnostic Luciferian priest quite a bit. Fascinating stuff. Definitely check out Eye of the Devil. Uh, after we talked about it on uh, Boiler Room, I got really curious. And it is a very, very fascinating movie. Now, isn't it neat, too? I know we're off topic, but we're on the topic of the Luciferian human sacrifice cults in movies. Isn't it interesting that Sharon Tate would be killed a couple years later as a result of the Manson cult and the Manson murders, right? After marrying Roman Polanski. Uh, I don't, Plans it wasn't Polanski that did I the Devil, but it's just very interesting. She's in a movie as a witch. Her first movie is as a witch in a Luciferian cult. And then... Two years later, she's dead by a Luciferian cult. Now, back to Blade. They talk a lot about blood and the power of the blood. It's all about bloodlines. Even the villain here, the Frost character, Stephen Dorff, who is not very imposing. He's very much a paper-thin dude. So I'm not sure why they picked him as the as the villain, he's, 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 he's like, he's like, um, he looks like a soy boy, but he is, the, he's the head Illuminist vamp. Um, but he's not even a full blood. He's not a pure blood. He's some sort of weird hybrid. So he's unique like blade, of course. And so blade and Steven Dorf frost have to face off against one another. This is all, you know, typical type uh, typical type stuff, but there is a fascinating ham planet character. And if you don't know what a ham planet is, that was a term for morbidly obese people that was shut down on Reddit. And her name is Pearl. I put this up a lot on uh, Boiler room post because it's, it's pretty funny, but uh, Pearl is. We are seeing more the, more of these people, aren't we? Now this is ninety eight. Here's pretty Pearl for you. Uh, and TLC has a whole show devoted to people who have these issues. Uh, very bizarre stuff. But 
the ham planet phenomena is uh, becoming more and more prevalent. I think what we'll do this time, so I don't miss people's super chats, uh, at the end of each film, I'll read the super chats that come in for that time period. So when I finish Blade, uh, we'll move to Lost Boys. I'll read read the Blade stuff. So there's your ham planet predicted in <laughs> Blade. <laughs> Uh, pearl there, pretty pearl. Do we have any takers in uh, in the chat? Who who would would you hit that? <laughs> any pro pearls here? Smash one if you're pro pearl. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So by the way, I'm I'm seeing now that the what I see is about probably 30 seconds behind what you guys see. So, when I put stuff into the OBS, it takes about 30 seconds to register in the control room. So, that's why the super chats sometimes take a while for me to see. So, now th this is interesting because if you read uh, Bloodlines of the Illuminati, which I do recommend, it actually is worth reading. Um, if you exercise the stupid stuff from John Todd, who is what a fraud there is valuable stuff in bloodlines of the illuminati it actually has a good book uh and he got a lot of stuff right a long time ago uh, i'm not saying everything fritz says is right he says some kooky stuff but again there's damn it there's a lot of stuff in here that is solid here's pearl Reading Bloodlines of the Illuminati here. Uh, and one of the things that Fritz did alert a lot of people to was the importance of the bloodlines. This is true. Uh, the, the history of any of the European nobility, uh, Burke's peerage. Uh, there are plenty of Dyers and Scots in Burke's Peerage, by the way, which means that I'm elite and you have to worship me. I'm joking. Um, I do come from Scottish clans, though, and we do have names in Burke's Peerage. I don't know if that means anything, but... But yes, I do recommend Bloodlines of the Illuminati. Uh, I cannot think of any significant section of the book that's not the only thing that I would say other than the John Todd section being stupid is every now and then he'll say um, so and so is promoted because of their last name right like uh, anybody with the name Collins is part of the, the Collins bloodline and, and I, I mean he's he stretches some of that stuff but the overall gist of it and a lot of the connections that he talks about with the big foundations I mean this book was written in the 90s and he was quoting uh, you know, Carol Quigley back then. There are significant quotes about Quigley here. And uh, he was talking about the Dutroux affair. He was talking about all this stuff back in the 90s. So I will give Fritz some, some props and some cred for that. A lot of stuff he says is goofy. <laughs> A lot of it's out there. But, you know, we take the good and the bad. We, we, we uh, look at the Sift the wheat from the chaff. It is worth reading, though, if you've never read it. My screen is not updating here very well. So I'm not seeing Pearl. I'm still seeing Blizzard. Anyway. So that's a good Halloween read. Bloodlines of the Illuminati. That's a great one for Halloween, right? So they talk, though, a lot about the importance of bloodlines here. And uh, one of the things that's a common theme here that isn't explored a whole lot which there is something too is the idea of the Frankish Merovingian bloodline. Now, I don't think that this is like the be all end all. I'm not going to make some dumb antichrist prediction. That stuff's kind of stupid when people do that. There is a tradition though in in the European nobility. You see this in British Israelite heresy theory uh, where they think that that the, the British monarchs are in some way descendants of Jesus 
the the Merovingian history says that they are descendants of Jesus. So there is some kind of weird thing going on with Gnosticism and cults in France and the Frank the, the Frankish Norman, right? I mean, they conquered England, right? Uh, there's something to this. I haven't nailed all this down yet. You know, this was big back when they were promoting that garbage Da Vinci Code book, right? That's all nonsense. Uh, and I've read Bygent and Lee. I've read all that stuff. So I'm not trying to say that's true. I don't think the Priory of Zion is real. I think that's a fake conspiracy theory. That guy was a fraud. There is something to the this weird idea amongst the European nobility that they, they have some sort of descent from Jesus. I think Fritz touches on that as well. But now this this is to bring things full circle, circle here. Uh, Romanides, who I've critiqued many times, the one thing I do think he's onto something with is his Frankish thesis, the rise of the Frankish power. Uh, there's something to that. So I'll leave it there. And I will say, if you want a really fascinating scholarly introduction to this topic, uh, back about 10 years ago, I read this book, which is very good. It's super scholarly. I mean, mega footnoted. I took 50 pages of notes from this book here, and it, it relates directly to what I'm talking about. Medieval Heresy by Malcolm Lambert. This is an excellent book. And if you read that, you will get a great analysis of... By the way, who else is talking about this kind of stuff on Halloween? Not many people. But you're getting it at Jay's analysis, baby. And the dorks and the SJWs, they can they can ban me on Facebook. I'll just keep talking. I'm not going anywhere. We're going to keep Pearl up there, too, because she's emblematic of our age, isn't she? Isn't, yeah, she's, Pearl is very SJW. Fat acceptance. So, Bloodlines of the Illuminati. Uh, read it with a grain of salt. You'll be able to, to figure out the wheat from the chaff. And if you want a really scholarly approach, which will touch on this weird thing of there is something going on with France and the Gnostic tradition. Right? The, we all know about the Cathars. Well, we don't all, but, uh, you know, there were, in fact, entire castles and villages. This is what was funny about. I'll pull this up for you about the um, the movie Eye of the Devil was that it consciously built on Chateau de Montségur, right? And of course, we all know about the Rothschild mansions in France, and we've all heard about this. Uh, and this was a medieval Gnostic stronghold. Everybody's, everybody's uh, enmeshed in all the new conspiracies and the most recent things. We've all forgotten about the bloodlines and the, uh, the elite and the French elite. Now, where's my... Here it is. Montségur. Castle, Castle de Montségur. De Montségur. <laughs> Uh, I think it's pretty much in ruins now, but if you watch Eye of the Devil, I'm like, dude, this is all straight out of Malcolm Lambert's Medieval Heresy. And Eye of the Devil ended up having like three different directors, and it was kind of a kind of a flop, but um, it's it's a good old movie. I recommend it. And you'll notice again similar themes between Blade. Vampirism uh, and uh, medieval Gnostic Luciferian sects. Here it is. I have the devil with uh, Donald Pleasance, uh, Rebecca, er, Deborah Kerr, David Niven. Ah. Very interesting movie. All and by the way, uh, the symbol. Interestingly, for the Luciferian 
sect in the film. Can you guess what it is? Why it's the all-seeing eye. So actually, it looks like the uh, my control screen, by the way, is about two or three minutes behind the OBS screen. So when I put something up in OBS, you guys see it immediately. Uh, what's happening in the control screen, I'm seeing about two or three minutes later. So be sure and uh, I'll be sure and give time for the super chats. This time around, I won't miss anybody. Uh, Languedoc, I think. It wasn't Languedoc, another area of France that was a Gnostic stronghold. So there's something to this. There's something to this Merovingian thing. We think about Matrix, right? Matrix 2. The Merovingian plays a central role in the Matrix. And what is the Merovingian? Why, he's surrounded by vampires, isn't he? Yes, he is. In fact, when uh, the two dreaded out leisure suit wearing white guys with blonde dreads uh, when they walk into the room before they meet the key master they're watching vampire movies now this is interesting too because what was Roman Polanski's goofy comedy movie Which is also worth watching, by the way. It's actually pretty good. Vampire Killers, that's it. Uh, if you watch Vampire, The Fearless Vampire Killers, who are all the vamps worshiping? And are they in France? They might be in France there, too. Where are they? Let's see where they go. We're getting way off topic, but I just keep getting reminded of stuff. Uh, let's see where they are. Well, Transylvania. That's might as well be. So I remember I was watching Fearless Vampire Killers one day, which is again is kind of a comedy. And then out of nowhere, the vampires all start chanting to Lucifer. Isn't that interesting? And the Merovingian is quite clearly intended to be a vampire. If you go back and watch, if you doubt me, go back and watch Matrix 2. I watched it multiple times recently for the Hollywood Decoded episode that we did on it. Uh, and he is definitely a vamp, dude. So, of course, Blade uh, uh, gets into his sort of weird cruciform pose. And they're all doing this uh, weird ritual at their Temple of Eternal Night. Going back to, back to Blade here. And did you notice how it was all these black obelisks? These sort of uh, ashlar stone pillar uh, And do you know what that reminded me of? In the United Nations. We've all forgotten that the United Nations has a black Stone of Meditation. The Black Pillar. You know what I mean? What is this crap, dude? The Black Luciferian Pillar in the Meditation Room in the UN. Remember this? Right? Vintage Conspiracy. We're doing vintage conspiracy shit here, dude. So it was like hot conspiracy in the late 90s. This is when I first heard about this. I learned about this. Uh, and they have that... Uh, is it Sri Chinmoy? They have a... Live-in uh, guru there. The, uh, the guru of the UN where you go to the black meditation stone here. Can't make this stuff up. Shri Chinmoy, remember him? He looks possessed, doesn't he? <laughs> I'm not joking. This is real. By the way, I remember a long, long time ago when uh, you know people were starting to really get hip to the internet. 2004, somewhere in there. You know, you could easily find this kind of conspiracy stuff on the internet, and uh, 
remember having a long debate with a guy one time and I showed him all this and he was like, it's not a conspiracy. I'm like, well, what do you think all this is? He's like, well, it's just meditation. It's just, it's just, I'm like, well, it's new age stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. He's like, but, but there's nothing Luciferian about the UN. And so we looked over at the Lucis Trust, right? And everybody knows about the Lucis Trust, which is the, one of the UN publishing houses, which uh, publishes the works of the Theosophists, Blavatsky and so forth, right? Lucis Trust. Uh, no, nothing Luciferian about this, is there? <laughs> I mean, it's a damn sigil in here, right? Alice Bailey, Annie Besant, Blavatsky, all that classic conspiracy, conspiriana, we might call it. Well, now, all that stuff didn't go away. It's still relevant. You bet it is. Because the globalists all have one plan. Everybody remember this stuff? You guys remember this? It was very 2000, 2001 conspiracy era. But it's still true. And uh, as far as I know, Lucis Trust still exists. And they still... I mean, they have a Facebook page, and uh, yeah, they still have a website, and they say, oh, yep, the Lucis Trust still exists, still there, still public, still putting out all the same books. It was founded by Alice Bailey in 1922 um, to promote Theosophy, and they say, oh, we, we, by the way, who else is, uh, connected to the lucid world goodwill did you know that did you know world goodwill is connected to the lucis trust remember all that if you're newly woke you'll be you'll be happily pleased to know this stuff i'm sure a lot of you veterans here have known this for a long time all right anyway i just wanted to remind us that uh the the Besants, the Baileys, the Theosophists, the Steiners, all this, all those clowns, they're all 100% Luciferian. They're all 100% pro-Gnostic, right? So we are not off track here. We know what we're talking about. Now, the vampires are made up of a group of 12. The 12 spirits who are going to take over when they incarnate the, well, I guess the Antichrist, right? Uh, this, uh, this La Magra, the blood god. Now, what's interesting is that genetics is everything here, uh, and there's a speech by the bad guy, the frost guy, where he says, do you know what we believe, Blade? We believe in pure Darwinism, pure social Darwinism, pure Darwinism, and it is our right in this pure Darwinian hierarchy to prey on everyone else. Jason Ellis Listeners, that is the elite philosophy. That is it. They also try to kind of like seduce Blade with his, like his mom, some kind of weird thing with his mom. All that stuff's kind of weird. But, but uh, I, I would actually say, uh, having rewatched Blade, I've seen Blade twice now. I would say, yeah, this was actually, it's it's silly. But there's more going on here than I thought. They're actually talking about how important bloodlines are and how important the elite bloodlines view social Darwinism and their right to prey on everyone. And, uh, yeah. So Blade is kind of, you know, the subtle sort of Christ figure here. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to say about the, the 12 spirits here. Uh, the, the, the 12 demons that are that that make up this Illuminati Vampire Council. The reason that's relevant is that they represent the apostles of Satan, basically. And that was exactly what's in Eye of the Devil. If you watch Eye of the Devil, again, I'm spoiler alert here, but you, you'll want to go see this later on your own. The cult is 12 dancing men. The 12 dancing men of the Gnostic Luciferian French cult. They are representatives of 
demonic apostles. Very bizarre, but it, interestingly, it was in both films. And both films kind of have this human sacrifice vampire element to them. So that's my thoughts on Blade. Uh, we'll read some super chats here and see what you guys think about Blade. Jolene K, $10. Jay, thank you for what you do. Thank you, Jolene. Always appreciate your work. And again, thank you, Justin, for that super chat. $25. Um, really all that I know about the JFK, I'm sorry, the, uh, MLK assassination was the, uh, uh, deep state assassination for, yeah, Vietnam type stuff, that kind of thing. What I read, I think in Jim Keith, but, uh, I'm not super well-versed on the MLK event. DFC $5 Blanche was the good time whore, but you got to marry Rose. We're talking Golden Girls, right? And uh, yeah, remember, you guys, the special autographed Jay's Analysis Golden Girl shirt is still available to the person who impresses me. I haven't decided yet. What I was going to give it what, to Robert Taylor if he did good in the debate when I debated Robert Taylor on the Worski stream. 60,000 people live. Well, not live. 6,000 live, 60,000 people have viewed that. And the role Robert Taylor got got whooped whooped his butt his butt good <laughs> so he didn't win it he didn't impress me sorry sorry robert uh exposing the creeps when are you dropping the experimental album i will by the way one of my jay's analysis buds supporter sent me a bunch of audio uh, tracks to do improv songs to so we'll collect all this stuff together eventually and make a joke album Uh, one of these days. Do 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 do. I still believe. What's next? Are we at? Are we at it finally? Now I'm gonna blow you guys away on this one. Y'all about to lose your mind if you haven't heard my take on Lost Boys. Da 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 da. -da. Do 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 do. Where's it at? Lost Boys movie. Lost Boys Mormon fundamentalism. What the heck is that? Let's take a little side trip here just for a moment. Something weird popped up here. Let's see what Lost Boys Mormon fundamentalism. What, the, what is that? Oh, that's uh, people who were excommunicated from the regular Mormons. Right. Well, we're not interested. By the way, uh, Mormonism has an idea of the bloodlines too, but uh, we're not going to talk cults tonight. Where'd the movie go? I just had it pulled up. Let's see. Here we go. Joel Schumacher. Jason Patrick. That's what I was trying to think of. Yeah. Uh, wild cast here. Jason Patrick, Corey Haim, Kiefer Sutherland, Jamie Gertz, Corey Feldman, Diane Wiest, Alex Winter, Edward Herman, and quite a few references to J.M. Barry's Peter Pan and Neverland, isn't there? Now, there's some really weird stuff going on in this movie. Um, in fact, uh, my take on this movie was basically rewritten in Vice. Some chick rewrote my analysis and published it in Vice. I will give her credit, though, because she at least linked to my article. Not that I'm that interested in Vice traffic, but that's all you have to do is link to people. Uh, and give them credit. That's when it's not stealing. That's when it's not plagiarism. If you make documentaries relying directly on me and Jay Widener, and don't give credit like Jay Myers does, that's called stealing. Now, this fictional California town, I think, suggests a coven of 
of satanic ritual abuse going on in California. And if you remember, now Joel Schumacher is also the director of number 23, which is a esoteric numerology mind control thing with Jim Carrey. Everybody remembers this, right? Remember number 23? We should eventually do that movie. That was pretty crazy. Dissociation, alters, that kind of stuff. But this is 1987, big horror hit of the 80s. Everybody remembers this. Cost $8 million, made $30 million. That's decent for this. Uh, now, Diane Weist is Lucy. Interesting name, Lucifer. Her two sons, Michael and Sam, that's Jason Patrick, Corey Haim, are forced to move from Phoenix to Lucy's trickster father's cabin. This kooky old pot-smoking grandpa who represents the counterculture of the 60s and then the positive thinking no discipline approach mom of the 80s interesting commentary there uh, the fictional city of Santa Carla interesting so is that is that Santa Cruz is that Santa Monica could be I guess numerous places in California right and what do we see on the billboard at the beginning of the film we see missing children and uh, what's that right there right there right there in the middle why it's the pedo symbol isn't it it is did you notice that lucky 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 there Now, I don't think that's accidental. Uh, I mean, the movie is about kidnapped missing children, and we've got the FBI's pedo symbol there. But I think it's hinting at something. I think it's hinting that this kind of stuff goes on in California. And, of course, we all know uh, Corey Feldman told us this. Uh, where I'm sure everybody's familiar with the FBI symbol or a, a page that talks about this you know this was everywhere when Pizzagate was all over everything everybody knew about that uh, let's pull that up just so we know right symbols used by pedo groups FBI thing there you go Now you say, is that the only uh, evidence? Well, this movie has quite a bit of evidence for this kind of stuff. Now, the plot, as we said, centers around the single mom family. Again, that's emblematic of the 80s, being raised in the 90s, being raised by single moms. Very prevalent now. And they move to what is called the murder capital of the world. Uh, Kiefer Sutherland, David, plays the alpha dog in a band of roving, miscreant Aryan vampires who are members of a secret coven led by Max, the VHS rental store owner. <laughs> uh, so I'm sure most of you people have seen this film. I'm not going to give you all the details to it, but uh, we do want to talk about the fact that, you know, it, it is about human trafficking. It is about lost children being caught up into these cults, ritual abuse. Uh, now, Diane Weist wears an, an interesting necklace and her name is remember it's Lucy she wears the Egyptian sun disc necklace the winged sun and there's this this kind of Native American and Egyptian symbology is all throughout the film um, when the frog brothers are shown in the comic book store You'll notice that the phoenix appears. And then you'll notice the all-seeing eye here. I think in my original analysis of this, by the way, which I did a long time ago, uh, I had actually had more pictures, but you notice here again in the comic shop, they show you the all-seeing eye there with the mummy and the ankh.
And then there's all these bizarre references to the doors of all things in the sequences in the hideout, right? They're all meeting in an old abandoned motel. Is this the Hotel California? <laughs> Welcome to the Hotel California. Uh, so they they superimpose Jason Patrick's face on Jim Morrison all the time. I, again, I really not completely sure what's going on in these scenes. I never have been. However, uh, when he's enlightened, it is actually apparently through sex magic because he sleeps with star. And is enlightened. He comes alive. And let's not forget uh, either that it was reportedly Patricia Keneally, a witch, who who uh, 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 inducted J uh, Jim Morrison into witchcraft. And if you remember Oliver Stone's The Doors, which is a good movie, there's a whole scene that shows that. Like he, I think they do some kind of blood ritual. It's been a long time since I watched the doors. Uh, but you know, Dave, Dave McGowan has covered all that Jim Morrison stuff pretty extensively. Um, so I won't go into that, but we've seen this reference many times in films. Um, Malachi Martin in his book, of course, you can go listen to my talks on all that, where he talks about the satanic ritual stuff, but it's when he sleeps with star that he, kind of like dissociates and goes into the astral realm and he's kind of floating around, flying around, uh, almost inducted. He's not fully inducted. If you remember, he's kind of like half vamp for most of the movie. And then, uh, Corey Haim's trying to, to save him. And, uh, Corey Haim, by the way, very weird stuff going on. He's wearing girls clothes a couple times. He's got some very weird posters of young guys. So it's kind of like a buy type thing going on here. Uh, it's very, it's very bizarre. Um, but the Frog Brothers, of course, we all know what happens. The Frog Brothers save uh, Jason Patrick from the cult. But I challenge you go back and watch this, and you will see that my analysis is spot on. You can still find my analysis, of course, in Esoteric Hollywood 2. Uh, I think it was zapped when Jay's analysis was zapped, but it will be in Esoteric Hollywood 2. Uh, and of course, you know, that everybody knows the end of it. They beat, uh, they beat the vamps. But uh, I'll save the rest of that for you can read the full analysis in the book, but um, everybody remembers Corey Feldman, right? In his interview, uh, let's see if we can. No, it's not one to play, but let's see. And again, it's uh, Corey's in this, right? Corey is in. He's one of the Frog Brothers. Well, I'm not going to play. Everybody's seen those. There's a zillion of those going around where he talks about the abuse. So it's just very bizarre that he talks about the abuse. Uh, it's in this movie. So. Um, I'm trying to think if I'm forgetting anything about Lost Boys. I've seen Lost Boys so many times. Uh, yeah, I would, uh, that would be interesting to, to interview Corey film. He's done a, quite a few interviews with alternative media type people. He might do that. Um, <laughs> have you seen his video for millennium? His song? It's pretty funny. Uh, the Goonies references. And by the way, while we're on the topic of Goonies, uh, what's up next? Is it, um, let's do monster squad next because, Oh, I forgot. Yeah, Halloween's in there, too. Uh, Monster Squad is Goonies, by the way. It's another version of Goonies. So you start to realize as you get older, you look back at these 80s movies, 
that all of these other kinds of movies that you watch, they were all trying to mimic the successful 80s movies. <laughs> so Monster Squad is uh, so obviously uh, the Goonies, but still preposterous fun. All right, so Scott Morse, 20 bucks, thank you. As I'm coming to the end of Lost Boys here, can't stay long. Jay's talks have literally saved people. So I know ever notice superhero teams, uh, the mirrors of pagan pantheons. Yes, they are. Um, I was going to do an interview a long time ago with the guy who wrote the the book. Uh, I was Christopher Knowles. And uh, I'm not faulting the guy, but for some reason, I think he canceled. He didn't want to do it. So... Uh, heroes in spandex or underwear. Yeah, our gods wear spandex. Uh, so this guy wrote a book on it. And you're absolutely right. I think I still have the book somewhere. But uh, he didn't ever want to do an interview. So this guy talks about the hero the comic book says the replacement of the greek pantheon so you're spot on there scott thank you for that super chat much appreciated uh yeah i think that most people who follow jay's analysis who followed it for a long time you know we've been here for 10 years blogging three years hardcore audio and video talking about a lot of the same stuff so uh, i think overall we've had a net positive effect and you know we wouldn't be growing we wouldn't be seeing uh, we wouldn't be bearing fruits if it we weren't having a good net positive effect. So the fact that people try to shut it down, the people that people try to uh, report my profiles for criticizing public figures. Well, that's part of the game, I guess. But thank you, Scott. Anybody have any other insights on uh, Lost Boys? There's more you could dig into there. Uh, there's like the hounds of hell thing with the dog. Nanook, Nanook, Nanook. Well, actually, Nanook's good, right? He helps them. Or does, doesn't he kind of turn a little bit? Yeah, he kind of goes crazy at one point because he's he can sense that Jason Patrick's a vamp. And then Jason Patrick's almost tempted to uh, to kill Corey Haim. If you remember that scene, that's when Nanook goes off on him. Uh, but I think Nanook's the sort of the protecting guardian angel type figure in the movie. And then doesn't, uh, doesn't the VHS store owner, vampire coven leader, he's got some kind of like hound of hell dog. Oh, by the way, the, uh, the screen is way behind. I'm noticing because I'm almost done with lost boys and the, the Control screen is just now showing me the beginning of it. So that's good, though. We've got a good crowd here. Late night, 205. Happy Halloween, guys. Even though we don't really celebrate Halloween, Halloween we, we'll do the Jay's analysis celebration of Halloween. And uh, be sure and listen to the Sexy Sax Man song. Uh, I still believe. All right, what's next up? Monster Squad. I'll tell you what, I'm going to get a um, glass of water. My, my throat's getting dry here because I've already talked today for almost four hours. So I'll be right back. Let me get a little bit of water.
All right. Starting to lose my voice. Too much talking today. I'm still here, though. We're still going good. 200. Thank you, guys. Always fun with the Jay's Analysis crew. The peeps. What's up, peeps? I still believe. And the blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blee. Still believe. Monster Squad is uh, Universal Goonies. Exactly. Somebody in the chat said that. <clears throat> There's some weird stuff in this movie for being such a goofy thing. Now, <laughs> I remember when I went back and watched this, say, 10 years ago. I thought there's some kind of weird cult thing going on this because they're trying to uh, sacrifice virgin. But I didn't think much about it. Now I go back and watch it recently. And I'm like, oh, there's all kinds of stuff going on in this. Right? Now, it's, it's goofy as all get out. And we know that the idea here is that uh, every hundred years, the, the main five bad guys what like uh, Dracula the mummy Frankenstein Wolfman <clears throat> and Gilman make their appearance uh, and uh, the last hundred years a hundred years ago they were almost defeated by a band of freedom fighters who fucked up <laughs> they failed it says so the the intro credits of the movie are pretty funny, by the way. Um, uh, Van Helsing failed. Van Helsing screwed it up for everybody. And he tried to, uh, to invoke the, with the virgin sacrifice ritual, he tried to do the counter ritual with the dark crystal. This is interesting because it's very reminiscent of dark crystal here, right? Uh, he tried to open the, portal to the netherworld <clears throat> which would trap the bad guys the baddies didn't work so instead a band of b-grade goonies are going to be left to the task there's a funny line about the wolf dork does the wolf man have a penis his wolf dork I'm not I'm not I'm not being serious. It's not that funny. There's a there's a, a plethora of really bad lines in the movie, which actually makes it funny. But the old German guy turns out is a Kabbalist. Now I didn't realize that. The obviously didn't realize it as a kid, and I didn't realize it ten years ago when I watched it. But you go back and watch it, and well, he's got a menorah, and he tells them that the book is about amulets and the amulets can be used to invoke spirits and to protect. This is where the crystal comes in. Of course, the Kabbalists loved their magical amulets. And at first I thought he was reading like Yiddish, but uh, he's trying to quote German or he does quote German. So this magical rite Kabbalistic right is German, which is weird because usually, you know, when when entities are being invoked, <laughs> it's it's Latin because somehow, you know, Latin is uh, magically more spooky, right? I guess because of the Latin mass or something, people think that Latin is magically delicious or has some some sort of superior magic power because it's Latin, but not here. It's German. Uh, and the old German guy is the old Kabbalist. Now the monsters come out and they're killing people. The monsters are real. Uh, it's almost as if, too, we notice this in Goonies. The the kids kids are always super smart, you know, in eighties movies, and they always figure a thing out things things out that the the adults don't. Now a lot of people criticize this about eighties movies, but. Actually, uh, there's something to that. I actually do think that uh, 
kids can notice things that normie adults don't because they haven't been through the conditioning. So there actually is something to kids noticing who haven't been properly socialized and conditioned. Connections, patterns, right? Everybody knows the NPC meme thing, right? The NPC processing station. Do you know? Do you notice patterns? I was gonna see if I could play that clip because there's some interesting, some interesting things in that clip. No, no, I can't get it to come up. Um. NPC processing. No, I can't find it. But uh, you know what I'm talking about. The NPC funny video song thing that uh, has been going around. Oh, did I find it? Is this it? Where would it go? You can never find things when you want on here. Maybe this is it. Nope, that's not it. NPC, was it NPC Factory? Ooh, is that it? Uh, can somebody ha find it in the chat and I'll play it because it was really good. Anyway, I guess not. So, But uh, the, the normie adults, they can't see this. They can't figure it out. They're, they're, they're NPCs. Um, there's something to that. I really do think that. God damn it, I was really wanting to find that, that uh, NPC processing thing. Let me see if I, I know how to find it. It was directly relevant to this. And they talk, that NPC thing, by the way, mentions the Tree of Life, which is bizarre. And I was the one that was, we were talking about that in a boiler room, how this relates to Kabbalism, right? It relates to the husks. Uh, the, the, which in Kabbalism, the, here it is, the, the interrogation. NPC 0451, let's begin. I will ask you some free association questions. Please respond with whatever comes into your mind. Have you ever listened to the inner voice? Hearing voices is a sign of mental illness. Have you ever gazed at pictures in your head? How do I fit a picture in my head? Have you ever seen patterns within patterns within patterns? A tree of life. Input error. You hear that? Within patterns within patterns. Fit a picture in my head. Have you ever seen patterns within patterns within patterns in a tree of life? Input error. You have no ability to creatively reflect on anything. Top marks. Let's move on to stimulus response. How many genders? There are an infinite number of genders. Describe this headline. This headline proved men must be abolished. Who is this man? That is Cheeto Hitler. Top marks. Keep this up and you can become the new Elixir. Great video. Yeah, now, Tree of Life. NPCs are viewed as husks. Golems? Interesting. Yeah, they are viewed that way. I don't think that human beings are completely husks. They can become receptacles of parasitical vampiric energy, and that's what the husks of the Kabbalah are spoken of as. And that is what the mindless NPC is, in practice at least. Yes, they can be saved. <laughs> we are not saying that the no NPC can be saved. Um, now, how do we relate this back to... 
Well, this movie is suffused with Kabbalism to the Monster Squad. Uh, and ultimately, they are wanting to sacrifice a virgin to incarnate, what do they say? Uh, like ultimate evil or, you know, some kind of generic thing like that. Uh, what was it? Dracula, by the way, looks like a guy at the carnival dressed as Dracula. Really pathetic outfits here. But Frankenstein is a golem. Keep that in mind. So the idea of the Frankenstein mythology, Mary Shelley and all that. Yes, it's alchemy, but he's also a golem. And he ends up being the tool of the alchemist and a good guy. So Frankenstein in this, if you remember, is the good guy. He helps the team beat the other bad guys. And that's because the Kabbalist is able to use his his uh, magical words on Frankenstein. Uh, he is just like Sloth, by the way, in the Goonies. <laughs> He's the giant tarred friend like the Goonies. They even have uh, one of the kids in this dressed up like uh, Corey Feldman in Goonies. I mean... This kid over here on the right in the glasses. I mean, he's like the spitting B-grade image of Corey Feldman in The Goonies. So, but this is suffused with Kabbalism, even more so than The the uh, than the Goonies, oddly enough. Let's see. Anyway, there's not a whole lot more to say on this other than um, the golem is the tool of the Kabbalist. He saves everyone. There's a kind of restoration of the golem. He's saved <laughs> through this action. Uh, and the ritual eventually does open up the portal and sends these characters to their doom. Now, one of the things I laughed at was the rap. The rap song is unbelievably awesome. I mean, in a bad way. You got to hear this rap song. Let's see if we can play this. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's uh, good. It's here. I don't know if it'll be on YouTube, but We're listen to this. Now, it's almost like they just thought that every film had to have a dumb rap song. Like that, that's just like part of the. Remember the turtle rap? Go ninja, go ninja, go, 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 go. Stick a rap song in. The kids like the rap. Put it in. One of the worst raps of all time in a fun way. Only topped or equaled. By the Crypt Keeper's own rap song. Did you know the Crypt Keeper has a rap song? The Crypt Jam. This is a classic.
Do you think anyone else on YouTube is live streaming the Crypt Keeper rap? Who else is doing this, baby? Only at Jay's analysis can you see <laughs> such artifacts of arcana and imbecility. I'm going to add this to the uh, description, by the way, the Crypt Jam here. The artifacts of our, an arcana of imbecility. Drunk Crypt Keeper. Crypt Keeper chopped and screwed. enough of that so there we have the crypt keeper rap is there a zelda rap is there something worse than the crypt keeper who what's worse i'm gonna say the i'm gonna have to say the the monster squad rap is bottom of the barrel dude that's they're even worse than the crypt keeper rap uh crypt keeper is even remember uh mc scat cat the cartoon creature that rapped alongside Paula Abdul and then he got his own album MC Scat Cat had his own I think we have to if we were to put this on a a, a uh, totem pole at the top of the totem pole we would put probably MC Scat Cat and then we'd have to put Crypt Keeper and then we put the Monster Squad rap yeah I think so so anyway um not much more to say on that except that uh, this is just a Kabbalistic uh, plot. Very bizarre. Ritual magic is at, the, is at the center of Monster Squad. And who knew that? Who remembered that from their childhood in this Goonies knockoff? Was it a hit? Let's see. Uh, no. Yikes. Monster Squad was a giant flop. Cost $12 million and made 3.8. Ouch. Ouch. Bonus points for a lot of fart jokes and boob jokes in Monster Squad. Give them some bonus points for that. None of which are funny, by the way. Although I do like the idea of Wolf Dork. Because in some instances in the 80s, Arcana Dork did refer to the male member. And the idea of Wolf Dork kind of made me laugh a little bit. A little bit. Anyway, all right. Uh, where are my Halloween? I might have to skip Halloween. I don't, I'll hear my Halloween notes. Let's see. Old Jamie Lee. Curtisist. Let's see. Let's put a little John Carpenter on right now. That was. That sounds. That sounds fun for this spooky night. And we're going to have to slow it down a little bit so that we don't get dinged here. But not a whole lot of esoteric stuff going on in, in Halloween. There's a couple of things worth mentioning that I did notice. Ooh, that doesn't sound good. Let's try to sped up. <laughs> All right. By the way, the new John Carpenter album, Lost Remixes. Uh, it's great. I've been listening to it all the time. Highly recommend John Carpenter's new album. And no, John Carpenter didn't give me any money to promote his album. But it is an excellent... If you like Synthwave, you will like the John Carpenter Lost Themes album. And I think they're going to do a sequel album. Uh... like there's going to be a part two 
which is cool. But uh, the more I watch John Carpenter movies, the more I like it. We, we had a fun John Carpenter stream the other day. So if you want some new, some new old synth wave, check out Lost Themes. Um, one thing I did notice was that there's a weird discussion of destiny and fate in Halloween, which I didn't ever, I never caught before. And when Jamie Lee Curtis is in her high school class, they talk about uh, the poetry of who Samuels, and they talk about the personification of fate and destiny, and it never changes for anyone. So there's this sort of looming doom, and Michael Mar Myers becomes the embodiment of a force of nature. Right? He's he's almost supernatural. Now, why do I sell that? Well, that is the same idea in No Country for Old Men with Anton Chigurh, right? And this is right after the period of the Manson stuff, right? This is in the 70s, late 70s. Um, what's Halloween? 77? 78. And this is height of serial killer land, right? Serial killer, the serial killers are everywhere, right? Slasher movies, serial killers just happen to all be going on at the same time. And we know if you've read Program to Kill, which I've covered in multiple talks, the excellent Dave McGowan book, Program to Kill, of course, gives us the the um, insight into the atomization of society that occurred through the so-called kill serial killer phenomenon where the serial killers are everywhere. They're just everywhere. You can't go down the street, damn it, without a creeper serial killer living next door. Now, that's not true. But all of the Hollywood and all the fear propaganda made it seem that way. People, people think there's serial killers everywhere. Or they did. Right. Uh, Donald... Pleasance shows his face again as the psychiatrist, Dr. Samuel Loomis, Michael Myers' psychiatrist, who, thank you, Donald, you allowed him to escape. Good job. Way to watch over your patients. Michael Myers, we learn, uh, was a kid who lost it. So he's like the new Aeon, the evil child who becomes a force of nature completely possessed. There's a great line where Donald Pleasance speaks of him. It was as, as if he was no longer there. There was no soul. There was only black behind his eyes. I saw him, a force of nature. He has no conscience. There's nothing there, nothing left. No right, no wrong. The blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. This is what... This is what Donald Pleasance tells us. Now, why is that relevant? Well, uh, I wonder if we weren't getting the idea that the uh, demonification of the youth is what was coming in the new era, right? We know Crowley talked about the coming aeon of evil and all this stuff with the crown and conquering child. This is the Luciferian satanic view. Um, and the eventual birth of the Nietzschean, Ubermensch, Overman, Beyond Good and Evil, right? All this stuff. Uh, there, were, there are some interesting meta elements in the film where they are watching horror movies when the horror events happen. And this actually does produce some interesting atmospheric effects. And we almost get the impression like Poltergeist, which actually has a good message. The message of Poltergeist is, is the TV going to haunt America? In other words, is the reach of the demonic going to be achieved through mass media. That's the point of Poltergeist. That's why they throw the TV out at the end. That's why the TV is this weirdo thing that the spirits speak through. It's kind of going on here, I think, a little bit. And they even show, what, RKO pictures, which is interesting. The movie, everybody's watching The Thing. The Thing. Wow, that's another John Carpenter movie. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. They're watching the thing. 
and you see RKO Pictures, Howard Hawks' film The Thing on TV. Horror music plays while they watch Michael Myers. So, interesting. So, I'm going to read it in the Dave McGowan way, and I'm going to read it in a kind of um, esoteric occult way, like a Crowleyan type way. Um, I'm open to differing interpretations, but not a whole lot, I don't think, going on here. I think Halloween is kind of kind of on the face what it is. Now, there's some weird stuff in Halloween 3, uh, which is about a town that's controlled by TV signals. Now, isn't that interesting? Because that's what I'm saying is kind of a theme in the first Halloween. It's definitely a theme in Poltergeist. And in Halloween 3, which is a terrible movie, there's a cult that runs a town through TV signals. Hmm. Recurring themes and patterns here. Uh, and also, the. So I haven't seen Halloween 5. A lot of these are pretty terrible. Somebody was telling me Halloween 5 has something to do with CIA mind control. I don't know. I, haven't, I, haven't, I didn't get to it. Uh, and so we, we see at the end, of course, uh, uh, he's killed, Michael Myers, but he, he kind of takes on a uh, supernatural power, um, and he's described of as death. So is there is there just an analogy here for the approaching power of death upon us all? Uh, I know there's a new Halloween out now. I don't think John Carpenter directed that or had anything to do with it. Um but it's supposed to, I guess, round out the series where finally <laughs> Jamie Lee Curtis is going to have to deal with... Uh, now, there, w Halloween H2O is kind of funny. I mean, it's terrible, but it's uh, fun in a bad way. Um, I've not watched... There's zillion Halloween movies, so I've, I've not seen all these. I've only seen a couple of them, but... Maybe the third one deserves its own analysis because uh, Michael Myers is nowhere in Halloween 3. He doesn't have anything to do with it. It's a mind control cult in a town <laughs> no, no Michael Myers um, and of course I don't think John Carpenter had anything to do with any of the later ones so so yeah not much else I can think of here they do speak about M Michael being triggered which is curious language something I think Donald Pleasant says something has triggered him old Don tells us something has triggered him which is interesting language to use as a psychiatrist. And as our Gnostic Luciferian priest, our friend Donald Pleasance. Who Mystery Science Theater aptly Described as an old baby. <laughs> it's my favorite Mystery Science Theater Donald Pleasant's joke that I've stolen. He does look like, look like an old baby, doesn't he? All right. Any more comments or discussion of... I'm getting kind of tired. I'm We're going to make it through. We're going to power through life force here. Anybody have any interesting comments or insights on uh, Halloween? Did I miss anything in Halloween? I'm going to read the uh, Donald Pleasant's line one more time. How's it going? He says, It was there in his eyes. Nothing. No wrong. No right. There was no reason. No conscience, nothing left. Blackness, the devil's eyes, pure evil behind his eyes. There we go. All right. We come now to our final film of the night Life Force. This is a weird movie. Um,. I didn't know that this was written by uh, what's his name Colin Wilson is that who it is 
and Col uh, uh, Canon Films, Yoram Globus. There's a uh, fascinating documentary uh, out there about Canon Films, which is, is worth watching. Uh, and it, let's see, who wrote it? Dan O'Bannon. Yeah, based on Space Vampires by Colin Wilson. Now, Colin Wilson has some interesting books. Uh, I'm not saying that I advocate everything he says. I'm just thinking of the one that I did read long ago was his book, Something Occult. I think it's just, yeah, it's just The Occult. Uh, and it was an interesting read. I mean, it's not like a witchcraft type. I don't remember it being that. I just remember it being kind of a. Is that it? I think it's been through a bunch of different printings. Like the old print of it was. Uh, I'm trying to remember that. It's been so long since I read this book. Now, I don't know this, the whole, whole history of this guy. I, I knew somebody who knew him. Or claim to know him. They might have been lying. I don't know. But uh, somebody was talking about trying to set up an interview with him. And I don't know. I was like, yeah, I don't know. So I, this is not somebody I follow. But the reason we're talking about him is because he wrote this movie. So there is going to be some relevant esoteric themes in Life Force. Because he is the author. Of space vampires. Space vampires. Now, when did he write his thing here? He wrote this in... Because you're going to notice this is very similar to Alien. But now, Space Vampires was written in 1976. And the Ridley Scott Alien film... I'm looking to see when it was written. And it was written in 79. Screenplay by Dan O'Bannon. Is it Dan O'Bannon here? A lot of Dan O'Bannons. Yes. So Dan O'Bannon wrote the screenplay for Life Force in 1985. And Dan O'Bannon wrote the screenplay for Alien. So we have a... That's... <laughs> so that's why there's so many similarities to... Uh, between the two. Now, I kind of mentioned to Paul's Cathedral because that's going to play into this. This uh, Somebody hit me to this funny guy's uh, videos, William, Williamism. And he has some great breakdowns of the symbolisms in London. Uh, the symbolism of all the architecture and all that. Let me find this guy because I'm going to recommend his videos because uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm getting tired. I'm trying to, we're going to, we're going to power through this. We can do it. Paul's cathedral plays in this, uh, in this movie. That's why. S Williamism. I think this is him. Yeah. He's got a bunch of videos on spooky symbolism. Now, where is his S. Williamism? He's got a video on St. Paul's Cathedral. He's got a bunch of videos. Now, where is that one? And he's a pretty funny guy. Too. I, should, I should get him on sometime. I'll try to get an interview with this guy. But, uh, well, crap. Anyway, go to his uh, channel. And uh, you can find his uh, St. Paul's Cathedral video because he's going to talk about it as a, uh, I'm going to put it up here. This is his channel. He's got a bunch of videos. So look through S. Williams, Williamism, and you can find his Paul's Cathedral video. Uh, and it's going to make sense why in the film they use Paul's Cathedral for the site where they 
I'm not exactly sure what they're doing here. I think that's one of the reasons this movie bombed is that a lot of people couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. The movie had a $25 million budget, which was pretty good for 80s. Uh, and Toby Hooper of... Toby Hooper, Toby Hooper of... Um, Poltergeist and Texas Chainsaw Fame directed... Life Force. Now, Life Force, of course, the Elan Vital uh, is once again the blood, and the vampires here are aliens, but they're described of as psychic vampires. They zap the Life Force, the energy force, out of you, and we have the very standard uh, '80s blue lightning, which appears whenever they derive their energy. But once again, we, we think of uh, vampires, we always think of blood. And as Leviticus says, the life is in the blood. So that is true. That's a biblical idea. So there is something to bloodlines. Uh, I think that there are generational curses. This kind of stuff does exist, in my view. Uh, the baptismal uh, exorcism that we have in the church, the rites, they all suggest these things too. That's why in, at baptism, of course, you reject the devil. And there are exorcism prayers. Um, the aliens turn out to be vampires. And they are ancient prehistoric entities. As I said, very similar to alien here. We have the typical uh, spaceship that in encounters this, this uh, floating mass, which looks like a giant uh, pile of garbage in space. And it also looks like an anus and an eye. Very interesting. A giant anus that is an eye. Well, where have we heard of this before? This is a Crowleyan Gnostic idea. The anus is an eye. It's the eye of Lucifer. And I think Colin Wilson probably put that in there. I'm speculating. I don't know, but that's definitely what it looks like. It's like a giant butt. We're going to keep this, this uh, as... <laughs> as... Uh, uh, PC, not PC, G, I can't think, I'm so tired, let's see, Life Force Alien, and you can tell me what you think it looks like, now, in the image of the poster, it doesn't look like that, uh, but when they are floating into it, it's a giant colon, well, I'm not finding a good picture of it. Anyway, if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. At the beginning, they float down a colon. And there's a giant, uh, what looks like a giant butt. I will leave it at that. And, yeah. So, I think that's what's going on here. Uh, they create meth head crackheads. Everybody who they zap turns into a meth head. Total crackhead here. But, all right, make a long story short here to my, let's get through this analysis here. Uh, they have one nude chick and two uh, kind of foppish looking boys who are nude. Not boys, but men. Um, so it's this weird thing of a kind of weird trinity of two dudes and a babe who just kind of, Prance around naked. They get loose uh, in England because they've come back, of course, on the ship. And they start the zombie apocalypse because some of the vampires become zombies. So it's the vampire zombie apocalypse. They are off-world entities, and we later, we later figure out that they're not really vampires. They are, uh, as the guy reveals at the end, spoiler alert, the source for the vampire myths. Because they are interdimensional entities who possess humans and move from body to body. Well, that sounds like demons, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And that's exactly where the film takes us. The energy vampires are aliens and are demons. Um, one of the main characters curiously looks just like Tony Blair. Uh, let's see if I can see any. Now, the pictures only want to show the... Uh, the chick, so I'm not going to show any of those. It's not showing any nudity or anything, but 
if you've seen the film, you'll notice that the one guy looks just like Tony Blair. It's like he's the, uh, I guess he's like the prime minister or something, but uh, <laughs> it's like, is that Tony? Is like a predicting Tony? And it's not really predicting Tony Blair, but uh, he sure does look like him. And there, by the way, the this is very sperm looking, the ship, alien, the living alien life form ship, butthole ship. It's, it's a giant butthole ship. It looks like a sperm when it's flying around at the end. That's not accidental because the film concludes. Well, I mean, let's let's move through here. Uh, the eye is the the butthole eye is a giant light. <laughs> it's a, not everything in this movie makes sense too. By the way, it's it's kind of very confusing. Not a lot of stuff that we don't really know what's going on. Um, and the British blokes in the government, the blokes are bully by the booby boobies. <laughs> Quite consistently throughout the film, the blokes is bully They don't know what the heck's going on. And because the main alien uh, does kind of walk around with her boobs out, she bully the bubbies. And she's able to seduce her way to possessing some high up British guy, like some MP. So like where the demons are possessing the British elite, this is, and they're psychic vampires. This is starting to sound like, uh, the Illuminati or David Icke or something, right? The cheetah Uri. If you want to understand David Icke, you see psychic vampires, I'm not going to do, I can't really do a good day, but I, especially not this late. So anyway, this main chick is totally dangerous, man. They describe her as totally dangerous because she is irresistible in her seduction techniques. You'll notice as well, this the film is very similar to Childhood's End. And of course, Arthur C. Clarke was in the circles of Crowley. And if you've read Childhood's End, then you know that the, uh, the, the alien entities uh, are basically demonic. Once again, this is also in the Crowleyan mythos that the interdimensional entities are aliens, or they seem to be. It's a kind of exotheology, right? And when they sap the people, they leave husks. Once again, we're back to the NPC husk from Kabbalah. Uh, and everybody that they zap is, like I said, they're, they're like meth heads or they got the AIDS. Or they got both. They're like, this is what they're going to. You're either going to be Pearl. Remember Pearl earlier from. Dude got the AIDS. Uh, where's Pearl? Yeah. These are your two options in the New World Order for body styles. <laughs> which do you, which would you like? Designer body styles. Would you like to be meth head, crack head, or pearl? These are the two designer body styles for the Vampire Illuminati takeover. These are your two options. That's all you get. Uh, or you can just not exist. That's also uh, a very appreciated option. Um, let's see what else. There's a lot of ridiculous stuff in this movie, like spaceships that have paintings of Haley. The astronomer paintings in spaceships. Yeah, I don't know. Um, all right. I'm starting to fade here. We're going to finish this though. We're almost to the end. So basically they, uh, this entity is looking for a mate to incarnate. So you're thinking it's like a antichrist type thing, blah, blah, blah. And then she mates with the captain of the ship who, originally found her and they do this in Paul's Cathedral. Now Paul's Cathedral is a giant as I said from uh, S. Williamism's videos he has a great video uh, when I was in London by the way I did visit Paul's Cathedral but it was closed so I couldn't go in the day that I visited but uh, what we learn is that this is not really anything to do with Christianity at all, especially not nowadays. It's like a giant Masonic 
uh, temple of humanism is essentially what St. Paul's is. Uh, and that makes sense. I mean, Christopher Wren was building stuff on hermetic principles. It's it's great architecture. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's not good architecture. Uh, but, yeah, this is like Masonic temple of human worship of man stuff. This is not anything Christian at all. I'm trying to get a good picture here. Uh, yeah. Very little to do with Christianity, except in the humanistic reinterpreta reinterpretation of Christianity that you find in Gnosticism and Freemasonry. So that's what is going on at St. Paul's, and they're they're in it, or they're at the. It looks like they're in it because the chick, who is essentially this whore of Babylon type thing, uh, she's trying to find a mate, and she's trying to engage in sex magic, and they actually do it in a crypt. So there's some definite sex magic theme going on here. Um, who is this? Well, the the Brit captain eventually says that she is the destroyer of worlds. So I'm going to say she's supposed to be Shiva, right? She is the great whore slash Shiva, uh, right, outside of uh, CERN. I think that's what Colin Wilson wants us to think, I'm guessing. Again, the movie is, is, is very confusing uh, as to what exactly is going on here. But if you haven't seen this, of course, outside of CERN, whatever CERN is, some kind of front, they have the dancing Shiva there, right? The Destroyer of Worlds, and that's what they say about this entity, right? Lilith is the same idea here. Lilith is the destroying demoness. And by the way, Zechariah seems to speak of demonesses. If you read Zechariah 5. We'll do a separate stream on that one day. But I do have an essay about Lilith. Lilith is mentioned in Isaiah 34 in the text. So there is some sense in which there might be demonesses in the spiritual realm. Um that's a, that's a topic for another time, but that's what this movie is actually hinting at this, interestingly. There's some, some of this is in the film. And certainly, of course, Crowley thought, you know, you could, he could invoke the whore of Babylon and all this kind of crap, all of which is nonsense. But uh, anyway, this sex ritual, which is not that graphic of a movie. This is like a, uh, is it rated R? I don't know what it's rated, but uh, I mean, there's like boobies. So it's not really like a gra It sounds more graphic than it actually is. It's, it's really dumb, actually, when you watch the movie. Very bizarre and silly. And it makes no sense. The ending makes no sense because uh, the guy just leaves. So it's basically like a Luciferian rapture, uh, a, an inverse rapture of the evangelicals. They don't take Nick Cage. Uh, well, actually, I guess Nick Cage doesn't get taken in the rapture. I don't know. Does he? I've never watched that stupid movie, but... Um, he gets raptured after the zombie apocalypse out of the crypt sex scene. Here we go. This is all straight up cryptocracy, right? This is very much a cryptocracy movie. Uh, and who does the vampire finally possess? The British elite. The, the, the heads of the British, I guess he's intelligence. I don't know what he is. So this is appropriate. <laughs> he's, he's a psychic vampire. And... She says to the main guy, uh, join me in the web of, dis of destiny, which is from uh, Virgil's Aeneid, I think. Or, you know, it's from the story of uh, either Ariadne or Athena, right? Who weaves the, um, or Arachne maybe, who weaves the web of, of the loom of destiny in mythology. And so she's also uh, an embodiment of that as well. And it ends in a crypt in, in London. Very illuminist here. Uh, and you're thinking, is this the Antichrist? What's going on? Well, she just raptures the guy after they have destroyed Earth. And they fly off in their garbage butthole spaceship. And you're like, what? <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> like, uh, 
yeah so 2001 space odyssey or you know what what what, what is this i don't know uh and of course the the butthole uh spaceship actually also res- resembles semen it just depends on which vantage point you're looking at the ship so a fun b movie goofy uh entertaining uh i'm going to give it i'm going to give it three pairs of underwear to cover up the butts um out of 10 <laughs> out of 10 underwears uh, all right, so yeah, we're approaching late night here. It's winding down at Jay's analysis. We've had a good time here. Um, we got into some crazy stuff. We were all over the place. But what is what's the overriding theme tonight? Aside from Halloween, although we might could tie Halloween into this, the overriding theme of of the of the vamp night was parasitical energy vampire Luciferian bloodlines that believe in social Darwinism and have some connection to some sort of Merovingian Gnostic Frankish secret society cult, which there's something to all this. Uh, and uh, yeah, we got a super chat here from... Uh, I'm, so, I'm too tired, I can't even read it. Mar Manfred von Thistlebaum... Matilda May gives one of the best performances I've ever seen in Life Force. Is that the is that the babe? Is that the vamp babe? Yeah, that would be her. Vamp babe. Whore Babylon. All right. Any more super chats as we close this down on the spook stream? Hope you guys enjoyed it. Check out uh, the other streams, the other topics. Did anybody learn anything? Want you? I don't want anybody in my cult. I don't run a cult. Great night. Thank you, guys. Yes. Now, see, this is kind of behind, so I'm not going to be able to see. If, if anybody's leaving a super chat right now, it's going to come up later. So... Uh, I'll give it a couple minutes. I'm going to go ahead and close it, but I'll play some songs, or a song. I'm gonna, I'll sing a little bit more one more time here. The I Still Believe. Can I power through it? It's pretty late. Let's see if we can do it. Oh, man. I'm going to sleep good tonight after like five hours of talking. <clears throat> All right, let's see where internet's running slow here. Well, crap, where's the history? I still believe. The only reason I'm doing the song is so that we can uh, let the last few minutes pour in here. And then we're going to close up shot. Let's see, here we go. Yeah, here we go. days to lighten my way I want to give out I want to give in this is our crime this is our sin but I still believe through the pain and the grief (laughs) (coughs) losing my voice I still believe 
I still believe I still believe I still believe <coughs> I'm not gonna have any voice tomorrow <coughs> <clears throat> Flat on my back, out to sea Hopping these waves, don't cover me Hoping I'm turned and tossed Upon the waves, when the darkness comes I feel the grave, but I still believe I still believe, through the cold and the heat I still believe Through the rain Through the tears Through the crowds And through the cheers oh, I still believe I still believe I still believe It's getting harder and harder to hit those those leaves. I still believe. <coughs> March this road. I'll climb this hill upon my knees. If I have to, <laughs> I'll take my place upon this stage. I'll wait till the end of time. Like everybody else. I'm out on my own, walking the streets Look at the faces that I meet I feel like I, like I wanna go home What do I feel, what do I know But I still believe, yes I still believe Through the shame, and through the grief Through the heartache, and through the tears through the waiting and through the years For the people like us in places like this We all need hope that we can get oh, I still believe I still believe <laughs> Okay, guys, great night. God bless you all. And I hope it was fun. Happy not Easter. I mean, happy not Halloween. And uh, still believe. Keep on still believing. Like Tim Capello told us. <laughs> <laughs>